Hi everyone! In this video, I will talk about asynchronous programming in ASP.NET Core and share with you some additional info about the topic other than just how to modify the synchronous code to the asynchronous one. Of course, I will show you how to do that as well. Async programming is a parallel programming technique that allows the working process to run separately from the main application thread. By using async programming, we can avoid performance bottlenecks and enhance the responsiveness of our application. That's because we are not sending requests to the server and blocking it while waiting for the responses. Now, it's very important to understand that if we send a request to an endpoint and it takes the application 3 or more seconds to process that request, we probably won't be able to execute it any faster in async mode. It will take the same amount of time as the sync request. Well, let's visualize that. Let's imagine that our thread pool has two threads and we have used one thread with the first request. Now, the second request arrives and we use the second thread from a thread pool. At this point, our thread pool is out of threads. If a third request arrives, now it has to wait for any of the first two requests to complete and in return assign threads to the thread pool. Only then, the thread pool can assign the return thread to a new request. As a result of a request waiting for an available thread, our client will surely experience a slowdown. Additionally, if the client has to wait too long, they will receive an error response, usually the service is unavailable 5 or 3. With asynchronous requests, the situation is completely different. When a request arrives at our API, we still need the thread from a thread pool. So that leaves us with only one thread left. But because this action is now asynchronous, as soon as our request reaches the I.O. point, where the database has to process the result for 3 seconds, the thread is returned to a thread pool. Now we again have two available threads and can use them for any additional request. After the 3 seconds, when the database returns the result to the API, the thread pool assigns the thread again to handle that response. So, with that cleared out, Let's learn how to implement asynchronous code in an ASP.NET Core application. The async and await keywords play a crucial part in asynchronous programming. We use the async keyword in the method declaration and its purpose is to enable the await keyword within the method. So yes, we can't use the await keyword without previously adding the async keyword in the method declaration. Also, using only the async keyword doesn't make our method asynchronous, just the opposite. The method is still synchronous. On the other hand, the await keyword performs an asynchronous wait on its argument. It does that in several steps. The first thing it does is to check whether the operation is already complete. If it is, it will continue the method execution synchronously. Otherwise, the await keyword will pause the async method execution and return an incomplete task. Once the operation completes, a few seconds later, the async method can continue with the execution. Well, let's see this with an example. So, even though our method is marked with the async keyword, it will start its execution synchronously. Once we log the required information synchronously, we continue to the next code line. We extract all the companies from the database and to do that we use the await keyword. If our database requires some time to process the request and return a result, the await keyword will pause the get company's method execution and return an incomplete task. During that time, the thread will be returned to a thread pool, making itself available for another request. After the database operation completes, the async method will resume execution and return the list of companies. From this example, we see the async method execution flow. But the question is how the await keyword knows if the operation is completed. Well, this is where the task comes into play. In asynchronous programming, we have three return types. Task T result for an async method that returns a value, only task for an async method that does not return a value, and void which we can use for an event handler. From C sharp 7.0 and onward, we can specify any other return type if that type includes a getAwaiter method. It is very important to understand that the task represents an execution of the asynchronous method and not the result. 
the task has several properties that indicate whether the operation was completed successfully or not. With these properties, we can track the flow of our async operations. This is also called task-based asynchronous pattern, or TAP. Now that we have all the information, let's do some refactoring in our completely synchronous code. This is also the code I use in our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, and you can find the book linked in the description below. Feel free to check it out if you want to master all the best practices to create powerful, production-ready web APIs. And also, check out our Blazor course to create client c -sharp apps without using JavaScript. Again, the links are in the description below. So, this project uses the repository pattern, and here I won't modify the iRepository base interface and the repository base class. That's because I want to leave a possibility for the repository user classes to have either sync or async method execution. Leaving this option is always a good choice. Now, in the contracts project, we can find the iCompany repository interface with all the synchronous method signatures that we should change. That said, let's modify the getAllCompanies method and use the task as part of the return type and add an async suffix to the name of this method. As you can see, I left the create method signature synchronous. That's because in this method, I am not making any changes in the database. All I'm doing there is changing the entity state to added. So, following the interface changes, let's modify the company repository class, which we can find in the repository project. Here, I need the async keyword first, and then the task as part of the return type. Also, I have to modify the name of the method, the same I did inside the interface. Now, I need the await keyword here, and I have to use the toList async method instead of toList. Great. Next, we can inspect the iRepository Manager interface and the repository manager class. Here you can see the save method that calls the save changes method from the context. Well, I have to change that as well. Let's start with the interface first. Instead of the void return type, I will use task and modify the name to save async. Now let's change the repository manager class. So let's add the async keyword first and the task as a return type and also change the name of the method. For the implementation, I have to add the await keyword and call the save changes async method instead of the current one. And that's it. I'm done with the repository layer changes and we can continue with the service layer. Just before I start the modification, I assume you already noticed that I'm using the Onion architecture here. And if you want to learn more about this architecture pattern, feel free to watch the video linked in the description below. Ok, again, I have to start with the interface modification. I need the task here, and let's change the method's name. Also, for the create method, I will add the same modifications. After that, I will modify the service class methods one by one. Following the same pattern, I will add the async keyword first and then use the task for the return type. Also, I will modify the name here. Inside the methods body, I need the await keyword here and also I have to call the proper methods name here. The same applies to the create method. So let's add the async keyword, then the task here and change the name of the method. Finally, since I modified the save method to be the async one, I have to use the await keyword here and change the name to save async. That's all the changes I have to make in the company service class. Now I can move on to the controller modification. Well, I will simply replace the current code with a new one. As you can see, I'm simply following the same pattern. I'm using the async keyword adding a task for the return type and using the await keyword when calling the awaitable method from the service layer. But I'm not doing one thing here. 
I'm not changing the action names. The main reason for that is when a user calls a method from our service or repository layers, they can see right away from the method's name whether the method is synchronous or asynchronous. Also, your layers are not limited only to sync or async methods. You can have two methods that do the same thing, but one in a sync manner and another in an async manner. In that case, you want to have a name distinction between those methods. But for the controller's actions, this is not the case. We are not targeting our actions by their names, but by their routes. So the name of the action doesn't add any value, as it does for the method names. Excellent, now we're talking async. With that done, let's talk about continuation in asynchronous programming. The await keyword does three things. It helps us extract the result from the async operation. We already learned about that. It validates the success of the operation and it provides the continuation for executing the rest of the code in the async method. So, in our get all companies async service method, all the code after awaiting an async operation is executed inside the continuation if the async operation is successful. Now, when we talk about continuation, it can be confusing because you can read or watch multiple resources about the synchronization context and capturing the current context to enable this continuation. But this is the case for ASP.NET applications. In ASP.NET Core applications, we don't have the synchronization context. ASP.NET Core avoids capturing and queuing the context. All it does is take the thread from a thread pool and assign it to the request, so a lot less background work for the application to do. One more thing I must mention here. We are not limited to a single continuation. This means that in a single method, we can use multiple await keywords. Now, let's see a common pitfall that you can see in async applications. In our get all companies async repository method, if we didn't know any better, we could have been tempted to use the result property instead of the await keyword. We can see that the result property returns the result we require. But don't use the result property. With this code, we are blocking the thread and potentially causing a deadlock in the application, which is the exact thing we are trying to avoid using the async and await keywords. That said, let's return the code to the way it was. Lastly, let's quickly talk about exception handling in an asynchronous code. As I mentioned in the continuation part of this video, the await keyword validates the success of the asynchronous operation. So, all we have to do is wrap the code inside the try-catch block to catch those exceptions if they occur. But for this application, I have a global exception handler implemented. So, just for testing purposes, let's modify the getAllCompanies method by throwing a simple exception with a test message. And then, in the controller class, I will place a breakpoint here and remove the await keyword just to show you what the faulted async operation returns and how our code behaves without it. Now, let's run the code, send the request, and check the result. We can see this task has a single exception and the status property set to faulted. But as you can see, this exception didn't stop the flow. Our code just continues with the execution. That's because without the await keyword, the task swallows the exception. Furthermore, there is no more continuation and the operation is not validated. Of course, if I return the await keyword, run the app again and send the same request, you can see I got the response immediately and we didn't get to the OK method inside the action. Great. So, I believe you have enough information to understand how asynchronous code works in ASP.NET Core apps. This should help you understand the code you're writing and you can use the async and await keywords now with more understanding of what those keywords do. So with that done, let's finish the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again in the next one. Until then, all the best.